Hi, I am Alejandro Postigo, and this is my presentation, The Copla Musical, Escapist Songs for Marginal Collectives from the Spain of Franco to the rest of the world. Not much information exists on the Spanish musical, at least musicals akin to those performed on Broadway and the West End and having originated in Spain and in Spanish language, and maybe, only maybe, having been translated and performed outside Spanish-speaking borders. If we narrow this search down to Spanish musicals developed in the 20th century and brought to the non-Spanish world, the results will be close to zero. This lack can be partially explained by the disruption of an autochthonous Spanish musical theater during the Francoist dictatorship. And that form being progressively replaced by the importation of American musicals during the period following Spanish transition to democracy post-1975. This historical disruption of the Spanish musical theater paralleled the growth of the American book musical or those musicals which were more reliant on the integration of song and plot. Up to that point, Spanish musical theater had been limited to the remains of the zarzuela, an operatic form that used song and spoken word from the 17th to the early 20th century, and to a series of variety reviews largely comprised of copla songs, a folkloric storytelling and theatrical song form, which became a key component for the development of Spanish musical theater throughout the 20th century. Copla, like various forms of American musical theater performance, possesses historical links to both queer audiences and artists. Many LGBT poets, musicians, and lyricists like Federico Garcia Lorca or Rafael de Leon authored the form. LGBT popular singers like Miguel de Molina served as his primary performers and LGBT audiences embraced the form, first covertly during the dictatorship, later openly after the transition to democracy and still to this day. This presentation explores some LGBT connections and queer undertones of the Copla art form. The LGBT struggle of the Spanish people follows the development of Copla, moving from a dark period of censorship and repression during the Francoist dictatorship into a period of liberation and empowerment in the era of Spanish democracy. Copla accompanied the LGBT collective throughout the 20th century with many of the songs that were cherished in secret during the fascist regime becoming queer anthems in democracy. LGBT artists wrote and performed Copla songs, first secretively and then publicly, and the song's messages resonated with the LGBT community in times of persecution, torture, and isolation. My aim as an artist scholar has been to take Copla into the 21st century world and beyond Spanish borders. My artistic research and creative work present for the first time copla songs performed in English in the context of a musical theater narrative, creating points of access to the art form for English speakers around the world. My research presents copla's historical framework to highlight its emergence as a queer musical form in the shadow of the Franco regime. And the development of my original piece, The Copla Musical, creates a space for queer identity. From the start of the Spanish Civil War, fascist propaganda appropriated and manipulated Copla songs. During the Francoist regime, Copla songs, their themes and performers suddenly projected strong conservative images in tune with national Catholic ideals of the regime. But even within this time of ideological conflict, the songs kept their diverse popularity, drawing audiences from opposing political factions, victorious fascist rebels identifying with their new overt nationalistic contents, and defeated Republican liberals finding a certain level of release in the lyrics encrypted messages, ones that went unnoticed by the regime's strict censorship body. In this period of extreme political and social repression, one specially oppressive for LGBT LGBT collectives, these songs became in both content and performance a means to experience a certain degree of freedom. Performers were able to pass on implicit messages of diversity within a particularly authoritarian Spanish society, an act especially salient for an oppressed homosexual community. Since the transition to democracy, 
Coppola songs have been progressively and openly adopted by LGBT performers and audiences, creating an artistic space for an increasingly visible Spanish queer collective. Coppola expanded during the 1940s, bringing along with it resultant role models for women that were in tune with the official canons of the dictatorship. This presentation of Coppola singers and stars as virtuous women aligned with the regime's larger strategy to create a national conscience around what it meant to be Spanish. Female singers of Coppola embodied Spanish virtues and stories of their private lives spread through the media, framing them as ideals of Hispanic femininity and making them role models for what Spanish women should aspire to be. Stars of a Spanish spectacle were called folkloricas, a label originally denoting performers of Spanish folklore, but later restricted to women of strong Catholic values, virgin until marriage, but passionate and feminine. Although the folklorica icon was not a model of revolutionary resistance, but rather one of negotiated class interests, the potential for imagined and vicarious solidarity for Spanish spectators was certainly possible. In early to mid 20th century Spain, male homosexuals would largely have to settle for finding themselves within the performances of women. Despite other European countries popularizing male theatrical performance and even female impersonation, Spanish men needed to maintain their gender compliant macho image. This meant neither publicly expressing feelings nor performing in variety shows. A tight adherence to cultural norms meant that Spanish copla during the dictatorship was almost exclusively performed by women or homosexuals rejected by the regime. It was notably at this time that out homosexual Miguel de Molina became one of the first male copla performers to gain considerable fame, concreting associations between copla and homosexuality. De Molina stood as a gendered outlier, performing feminized copla. The form songs themselves typically centered on culturally feminized experiences, predominantly displaying emotions in relation to love affairs. The kind men were not expected to publicly express during Franco's male dominated macho culture. The few male singers who performed copla and wanted to preserve an image of virility adapted the repertoire to songs devoid of such feminine emotion. Such masculinized songs also served the regime's goal to use popular entertainment to expound the grandiosity of Spanish geography and gastronomy. Male artists such as Miguel de Molina, Rafael Conde and Tomás de Antequera resisted this change of focus and instead sang the repertoire popularized by female performers such as um, Concha Piquer or Juanita Reina consequently advocating a more mannered gay art. All three of these male Coppola performers acquired a relative level of success in their native Spain and subsequently in the praises of exile. In the 1950s, in what many consider the golden age of Franco's Coppola, the form was largely defined by popular female singers such as Lola Flores stars who projected an aspirational femininity for Spanish women, strong but pure, sexy but chaste, and unequivocally Spanish in their mannerisms and expressions. In addition to her more expected appeal to female audiences in need of Francoist indoctrination, the duality of Flores' persona made her an ideal point of identification and admiration for many closeted homosexuals as well. In the 1960s brought with them shifts in Coppola's evocation of Spanish femininity, a move from the regime approved sensual duality of Flores to the sexually experienced cosmopolitanism of Sara Montiel, who would become a gay icon and favorite subject of star impersonators of the 1970s. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, new flamboyant but straight singers like Rafael began attracting young homosexual audiences who uh, clung to their songs like Digan lo que digan, whatever they say, and Que sabe nadie. 
in the absence of queer national idols. By the 1970s, Franco's death seemed imminent and a sense of sexual liberation led to more explicitly sexually empowered messages within lyrics and a new visible strain of cross-dressing celebrity impersonators and transvestites started to perform Coppola songs for wider audiences in subversive venues. After Franco's death in 1975 and the abolition of government sanctioned censorship, Spain witnessed an erotic boom that gave way to the rise of a Spanish variety of trans spectacle. Audiences were drawn by their curiosity for what had been long forbidden. In this period of the late 1970s and early 1980s, trans theater flourished and became central to a cultural movement known as La Movida. One with its epicenter in Madrid and popularizing artists such as film director Pedro Almodóvar and singer Alaska. This post-Franco trans movement recuperated and updated early 1930s pre-Civil War shows in which star impersonators had cross-dressed to imitate Coppola singers. The cross-dressing scene practically disappeared during the dictatorship, but in democracy, it acquired more visibility and political presence than ever before. During these early democratic years of the 1970s and 1980s, trans visibility increased both on and off stage. And these performances of Coppola songs became statements of identity and politics as much as artistic expression. This new trans Spanish tradition provided an outlet for emotions that could not have been expressed in the previous political era due to the regime's political silencing. In the transition to democracy, this reappropriation of Coppola became very popular with an increasing number of artists performing the songs in drag. In democracy, Coppola became associated with characteristics of gay camp. Spanish queer scholar Alberto Mira associates camp with a homosexual positioning of contents proceeding from popular arts and whose sense emerges from a recycling of these forms. Given the popularity of Coppola throughout the dictatorship, and its long relationship with LGBT audiences, the covert contents of Coppola songs would become overt in democracy. But Coppola in the 1970s felt outdated, stylistically old and full of stereotypes. It needed a makeover. Into the 21st century, Coppola had been more openly embraced by transgender and queer artists such as Falete. He performs sentimental Coppola while dressed in feminine outfits, but without hiding his male gender, thereby flaunting a sense of androgyny. As Mira suggests, the performance of camp is the processing of potentially oppressive heterosexist cultural myths to transform them into a discourse of pleasure and affirmation of marginality. Rather than helping LGBT audiences escape from the harsh realities of homosexual erasure, post-democracy Coppola now helps reaffirm their existence in all its richness and diversity. Therefore, for many gay, transgender, and queer artists look to Coppola in the 21st century as a vehicle to express their feelings. This very affirmation of marginality inspired me, a 21st century Spanish gay immigrant living in the UK, to channel my artistic position. This affirmation of identity comes through my project, The Coppola Musical a performance piece through which I seek to export the new and empowered queer Coppola into the Anglo-speaking world. My research and related performance practice look back to Coppola in an attempt to reimagine an artistic avenue for an intercultural intervention with a new type of Spanish musical, one putting Coppola in dialogue with other international manifestations of musical theater. Mm -hmm. The Coppola musical explores how Coppola songs of the past might now be adapted for and integrated into a contemporary musical theater show conceived and presented outside of Spain in such a way that they negotiate Coppola's cultural identity within an alternate linguistic and cultural context. On the other hand, I strive to make Coppola's once implicit LGBT contents now explicit, not only in terms of camp reappropriation, but also by making what once was 
only queer lyrical subtext, the overt text of the songs, allowing them to achieve their full expressive, ideological, and even revolutionary potential now in an international context. I first developed this project as a book musical version of the Coppola musical between 2011 and 2013. The show explored the Spanish, um, the Spain of the Civil War era by the American exile of transgender artist La Gitana. Following a musical theater two act conventional format, the self contained Coppola narratives were expanded to become part of a whole new narrative. Um, let me make this small so that I can be in control of these pictures. <laughs> Um, in adapting the language and musical structure of songs, I did notice um, some musical compromises, like the blending of some flamenco rhythms, um, Spanish imagery, musical ornamentation. There you go. I hope you can see the pictures. <laughs> Uh, with Anglo idiosyncrasies defined either by the English language or by the tone of Anglo musical theater works. In 2014, I converted the musical into a solo show, attending to a new dramaturgy that paralleled the story of La Gitana with a contemporary migrant narrator and set in the 21st century London. The narrator figure allows for historical contextualization of La Gitana while providing contemporary perspective and commentary on gender and queer narratives. The show became a one hour piece in which one actor plays both the narrator and La Gitana. Within the show, all songs contribute to tell the story of La Gitana, whereas in the ensemble piece, they did this from a present narrative perspective. In the solo, we look at this narrative in retrospect. The songs themselves carry the weight of representing and unraveling La Gitana's character as the narrator keeps investigating her life. The musical and narrative development of La Gitana leads to an organic presentation and historical contextualization of the development of Copla. The solo piece trims the band down to a piano and violin which provide accompaniment and underscoring and help to create different atmospheres through musical motifs of Copla songs. The reimagining of the Coppola musical as a solo show emerged through a lens of queer theory, one that was able to aid in the exploration and ex excavation of um, gendered and sexual identities and expressions that informed the evolution of Coppola from its origins on through today. In the Coppola solo, the narrator looks to the character of La Gitana and her songs as inspiration to unlock his sexuality and gender identity. The songs sung by both La Gitana and the narrator unify their emotional journey and create queer narrative journeys between um, the two temporarily separated characters. La Gitana draws inspiration from the Spanish divas of the dictatorship era, folkloric firms, um, folkloricas who exhibited gypsy features such as black curly hair, often tied up in a bum with perfect curl adorning the forehead we've seen some before. Dark skin, self-confidence, temper, nerve, but also charm and duende, a term that refers to the power to attract through personal magnetism and charm. In the Coppola musical, La Gitana subverts such a gendered and ethnic visage through her trans identity. To sum up, Coppola was at the forefront of musical theater in early 20th century Spain. Parallel in the musical theater forms emerging in the United Kingdom and United States, forms also often spearheaded by minority communities. In a global 21st century, it simply makes sense to rescue this historic, historically, socially, and poetically charged song form and present it internationally through a new intercultural lens. That has been and remains my aim with the Coppola musical, a lens that embraces Coppola's queer history recuperates Coppola to potentially revive the Spanish musical and provides an opportunity for global audiences to encounter bits of Spanish cultural history and identity within these brief moments of the song. 
Thank you very much.